This is the most hated doctrine, but at the same time, it is the most distinctively Christian doctrine. No other religion has this doctrine. If you understood this text correctly, if you understood what I was saying, you would be shocked. You might even be appalled. Imagine a dead blind man. Just let him be both. It's a blind man who is dead on a slab, and in comes a razzle-dazzle preacher. This clever fellow, by using words, perhaps with an 80s soundtrack, some smoke, some mirrors, does everything in his power by using his eloquent speech to make the person who is dead alive, who is blind to have sight, is he going to have success? Of course not. Human words, human performances, cannot bring the dead to life, make the blind man see. And that is not only true in the physical realm, but it is also true in the spiritual realm. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. There is the most hated Christian doctrine, the doctrine of total depravity, the doctrine that declares that the whole human race is sinful. The truth is that you are a sinner dead in trespasses and sins, and your default position is to believe lies to such a degree that the truth seems demonic. That's how profoundly evil you are. Everybody is spiritually dead. We are in bondage to Satan. We are blind sinners who cannot see unless Jesus opens up our eyes. When Paul says that Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, he's saying that the nature of unbelief, that the essence of spiritual death is spiritual blindness. It is refusing what is most valuable, what is most precious, because you're blind to its value. This is the world's problem. They're blind to glory. Far too often, preachers will conclude, hey, in order to get people to keep coming to church, we'll offer them something that will provide a benefit for them. It will enhance their life. Therefore, we'll give them sermons that really, really make them desire to come back because they're getting something that they can use. The world's problem is not that they have unfulfilling marriages or broken relationships. It's not that they don't feel comfortable and relaxed in church. It's not that Christians don't like the same music that they listen to or don't dress the same way or don't use the same language or don't share the same politics. It's not even that they don't have enough evidence of the truthfulness of the Bible or for the deity of Christ. They have that evidence. Since the creation of the world, God's eternal power has been clearly seen, having been understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Unbelievers don't lack evidence. They lack the eyes to see that evidence and interpret it properly. Their problem is that they're blind to glory. They can't see what is supremely beautiful and glorious and valuable and precious. That is why God must regenerate sinners. And if you're thinking perhaps that this is some sort of Calvinist versus Arminian thing, it is absolutely not. Do we not all pray, Lord, please save my loved one. Lord, please save my children. It is a right recognition. You and I cannot do the saving. Now you're trying to save me. You can't save me. I can't save you. You're right. But I can share the gospel with you. I've been, I'm commanded to. We are to be the voice that proclaims the gospel. We give out the general call, but we must understand and it is God who must bring about an effectual call. You and I can preach to a piece of lumber until the cows come home, but unless a supernatural work happens to an object that has no ability to even comprehend what I'm saying, my efforts are truly in vain. The mind of every person has been darkened so they cannot see or understand the truth. The heart of every person has been defiled so that they do not love the truth. And the will of every person is dead and in bondage to sin 
and can not believe the gospel in and of themselves. Our goal, our job, our aim is regeneration of a dead sinner recognizing you and I cannot get the job done in bringing a dead man to life. Regeneration is God's work. This is the prescription. This is the remedy for man's spiritual blindness. Nothing at all that we can do, the sovereign work of God and regeneration. And if that's the remedy, then listen, all of our church services, all of our evangelism, all of our outreach, all of our relationships, all of our everything in our ministries must be aimed at regeneration. If our aim in ministry is not the regeneration of the lost, we have set our sights too low. We have set our minds on earthly things at the expense of heavenly things. And for all the temporal good we might do, we've made ourselves eternally obsolete, eternally useless. Consider the ministry of Jesus Christ, who never biffed it when it came to presenting the gospel, who delivered the most eloquent sermons ever. Who's the best preacher on the planet for all times? It's Jesus Christ. Did everybody get saved? If Jesus, with his beautiful preaching, with his miraculous works, wasn't somehow, if you will, converting them through his means and through his efforts, how do you and I stand a chance unless the Holy Spirit goes about the business of convicting the sinner of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and illuminating their understanding. We're not gonna get the job done. And so you go and you tell people this most glorious news in the world, the greatest news that anybody could ever conceive of, and they say, eh, hey, that, that's great for you. I, I respect your opinion. Thank you for sharing that with me. I really appreciate hearing your story, but we're just gonna have to agree to disagree. That is the miserable nature of spiritual death. People can look directly at the glory of Christ, whether it's the ancient Near Eastern Jews witnessing the carpenter's son performing miracles and healings and exorcisms, or whether it's 21st century Americans reading their Bibles or listening to preaching. They can look at Christ and see nothing of value. They behold glory and are entirely unaffected. Perhaps you've concluded, well, this is futile. No, no, it is not, because God loves to save sinners. God delights in regenerating dead people. It brings him the grandest glory. He is on your side when you're preaching the gospel. You are working with God and his Holy Spirit, not when we put on a show, not when we amuse or entertain or even offer life lessons, but when we preach the gospel, God works with the proclamation of his word to do the work that only he can do. We don't make our methodology or our style the draw of our ministry. We don't put ourselves forward as the appeal to unbelievers. We don't appeal to what is fleshly and worldly in the unbeliever in order to attract them and compel their participation. Instead, we do everything that we can to get ourselves out of the way so as to be merely incidental, to be just the finger that points to what counts. Mom, Dad, have you been grieving because you have given it your best when it comes to proclaiming the gospel, sharing the good news that Jesus died for sinners with your children and yet they are prodigals? Take yourself off of the guilt hook. You cannot get your children saved. God must do that work. Petition him at the throne of grace to save your children and do not feel like you were a failure because you couldn't get something done that you can't do in the first place. Do not grow weary of evangelizing strangers, students, or your own sons and daughters. Do it faithfully, do it rightly, but do it submissively, recognizing we are mere instruments. We are the waiters, the waitresses. We don't make the meal. We don't cause them to consume it. We just deliver it to the table from the kitchen without messing it up.
this is a whole section, uh, Jesus Magna Carta on evangelism. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day and the seed sprouts and grows how he himself doesn't know. So that is my mandate for evangelism. So and go to bed. <laughs> I am not in charge of the results. And you say, well, you'd be more effective if you had a designer seed bag. Really? Or if you could just back up your sewing with rock and roll music, that would really make an impact. I mean, what kind of ridiculous stuff is that? Now, if you're under any kind of illusion that anything matters but the sowing of the seed, then you don't understand how this really operates. What comfort is it to know that you and I are not called to do something that we can never succeed in doing. We are merely called to be faithful. So saint, don't grow weary, stay faithful. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. For all of you Arminian passengers, you might think you have free will, but not on this flight. So let's put those seats in their upright and locked positions. And for all of my Calvinist passengers who believe in the sovereignty of God, he may ordain that you're gonna crash today, but if you do, you're gonna do it with your seatbelts on. So let's just buckle up. 